Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to this AFM webinar on how additive manufacturing may change the heat treating world. I'm Frances Richards, Editor-in-Chief with AFM International, and we're glad you could join us. Today's presentation is part of the AFM webinar series designed to provide information you can apply to improve quality, efficiency, and performance. This webinar series supports the needs of our members, customers, and the materials community at large. The series also supports the outreach needs of the leading corporate supporters of ASM and its affiliate societies. One of these affiliate societies is the Heat Treating Society. HTS is the world's largest network of heat treaters, and our members work to provide events and services to their worldwide membership of captive and commercial heat treaters, equipment manufacturers, researchers, governments, and technicians. Explore the HTS community today at hts.asminternational.org. The sponsor of today's webinar is Solar Atmospheres. The Solar family of companies includes four world-class vacuum heat treatment shops and a leading technology vacuum furnace manufacturing company. The heat treat shops are located in eastern and western Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Southern California. The companies specialize in vacuum thermal processing. Solar Manufacturing, the vacuum furnace design and build company, is also located in eastern Pennsylvania and builds robust and efficient furnaces that meet the needs of demanding commercial and process environments. Solar manufacturing's furnaces are the primary furnaces that the four sister heat treatment shops use. We're proud to have Solar Atmospheres on board for today's webinar. Before we begin, let me mention a few housekeeping issues. If you're having technical difficulties in joining the WebEx session, dial 800 374-2441. All participants will be in a listen-only mode during the presentation. Feel free to submit written questions at any time by using the Q&A window located in the upper right corner of your screen. Click the question mark button to open the Q&A window. Type your question in the box at the bottom and click the send button. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. We're proud to host today's webinar. ASM has been all about heat treating since its founding over 100 years ago as the Steel Treaters Club. ASM International and the Heat Treating Society serve the materials community by providing scientific, engineering, and technical information, as well as education, networking, and professional development. The Society publishes HT Pro, the new quarterly supplement to AM&P Magazine, and also HT Pro eNews, which deploys weekly. These publications cover technological breakthroughs, trends, industry news, and society news, all related to the heat treating industry. Subscribe to these publications by visiting asminternational.org. The ASM Heat Treating Society's newest product is a free app that can be used by itself or as a companion to the popular ASM Heat Treaters Guide print and online database product. It is available at the Apple and Android app stores online. Go to hts.asminternational.org for more information and for direct links to the app stores. Also, the ASM education team is currently offering the following courses. Metallurgy for the non-metallurgist takes place January 25 to 28 at the ASM World Headquarters in Novelty, Ohio. And heat treating for the non-heat treater will be held February 1 to 3 in North Charleston, South Carolina. To learn more, go online to asminternational.org slash education. With that, I'd like to introduce the instructor of today's webinar, Bob Hill. 
Bob began his career with solar atmospheres in 1995. In 2000, he took on the responsibility of starting Solar, solar Atmosphere's second plant, located in Hermitage, Pennsylvania, where he has specialized in the development of large vacuum furnace technology and titanium processing capabilities. Bob has been a longtime member of ASM. In 2009, Bob's company received the International Titanium Association Achievement Award. In 2010, Bob was appointed to the ASM Board of Trustees. After serving on the Metal Treating Institute Board of Directors for six years, Bob became the president of MTI in October 2014. He was also recently inducted into ASM's 2014 Class of Fellows in Montreal, Canada. It is a pleasure for me to introduce Bob Hill. Thank you, Francis, and good afternoon to everybody on this webinar or wherever you are in the world. I see we have well over 250 attendees, which is wonderful. I want to also thank ASM for hosting today's webinar and also Kelly Sukol, who is helping pr produce this webinar, and our Susie Generalovich here, our quality manager, whose picture is here on, is on the screen, loading one of our mentor furnaces. And uh, she's going to help me drive the computer for me during this seminar, so thank you all. The title of my talk today is How Additive Manufacturing May Change the Heat Treating World. Unless you have been living in a cave for the past decade, we have all heard the buzzwords of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. We've also all heard the hype, and one would think additive manufacturing would soon be the cure for world hunger and world peace. Well, that's not really the case. The fact is, additive manufacturing is here today, but in my opinion, it has a long way to go. During this discussion, I will highlight what additive manufacturing or 3D printing is, some of the advantages and disadvantages that I see of this manufacturing process, I will review the jobs that Solar Atmospheres has processed to date. And in fact, I have some jobs actually on the floor today that I just took a picture of. So it's, it's here to stay, but only the processes that I know of the additive printing that we have processed here. And we'll go over the three major uh, printing processes. And then finally, I'll make some predictions of our heat treating industry how it will affect our heat treating industry in the future. So what are some of the technologies that have transformed our world? Thomas Edison, who's created or who's credited for inventing the light bulb in the 1800s. Nuclear fission and the splitting of atoms that changed our world. The development of the microchips which has really changed our world because our cell phone today is more powerful than rooms of computers of the early days. And today we're going to look at 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Chuck Hall was actually the inventor of 3D printing. Many people don't know this, but it was actually back in 1983. He used a UV light to harden tabletop coatings. He applied for a US patent at that time and coined the name stereolithography. So it has been around for many decades. So what is additive manufacturing? Additive manufacturing is a process where a digital model is converted into a component layer by layer versus subtracting material from a larger piece, a plate, a forging, a material, as in machining. So what are the advantages of additive manufactured components? Uh, the most obvious is to anybody looking at this process, there's much less input material that's required, which equals less waste. There are zero design constraints. We can print product that we could never possibly imagine machining. It brings the product to market faster, and it reduces or eliminates supply chains and production lines and reduces inventories. 
This is an accountant's uh, dream to do this. And this is very important, so much so I read in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago where UPS and FedEx is viewing this technology as a major disruption to their $58 billion business. They know very well that they were hurt before by the internet and the overnight document delivery business. The scanning of documents now can be done in real time and documents are no longer shipped around the world overnight. So both UPS and FedEx see this as a disruption and they've invested in over 1,000 printers. Uh, they will take an order for a Whirlpool part for a dishwasher and they want to print the part and have it to your door the very next day. Amazon is even looking at exploring into 3D uh, printing trucks. So they'll pull up right in front of your door and print a part uh, for your use. So this is something that's looking at, many people are looking at as a disruption of business. Designs will move around the world as digital files, not as products. Foreign production, I believe, could be reshored more locally because many of the printing companies, printing machine companies, are right here in the United States of America. So that's good news for our business here in the States. And of course, carbon footprint with less input material could be dramatically reduced. Some of the disadvantages of added manufactured components that I see, printing machines are very expensive. They, it, depending upon the size of them, they can be in excess of one, over $1 million. Feedstock and materials are very expensive. I have seen feedstock powder especially go for anywhere from $300 a pound to $1,200 a pound, uh, $1,200 a pound being highly specialized spherical titanium powders. 3D printing lacks industry-wide standards. These next uh, three bullet points are the number one hurdle, to, in my opinion, for additive manufacturing. Um, this, is, this is the biggest hurdle that, that the engineers have to overcome. Due to the metallurgy, new qualification and verification standards need to be developed, and many are working it every day. And there are some leaders that have taken uh, the lead in this, in, in our industry. New quality assurance techniques need to be quantified. Also a disadvantage is slow build rates. Today, this process is not very conducive to high production. And we are limited in the component size that we can print to the printer size. Now again, I am no, by no means an expert in the various methods of printing, but I'm just gonna talk about right now some of the jobs that we have seen here at Solar Atmospheres and we have processed uh, thermally and some of the heating methods that we've employed. The first method I'd like to review is called the DMLS, Direct Metal Laser Sintering Process, um, much like the fuel nozzle that you saw in the video clip. This is achieved within an inert chamber with a focused laser that melts the surface of the target material, forming a pool of molten metal. Then metal powder is then delivered into the molten pool, forming a deposit. This picture that you see here is actually a decorative part that our facility in Southern California he treated. It was actually for a yacht in Southern California it was made out of titanium powder. It stands about four foot high. And every one of those ribbons that you see there is hollow to eliminate weight. Uh, weight. But um, a very interesting part that was formed by the DMLS process. Again, very difficult to machine something like that. This process has a low rate of deposition, however, results in a finer detailed product, much like you saw in the fuel nozzle. Um, also, materials used with this method that we have touched are titanium, inconel, and chrome cobalt alloys. This is a part that we actually, I just took this picture this morning, um, we would never run this in that basket because uh, the temperatures we're going we're to homogenize this part at, 
But this is a part, uh, this is an Inconel part, and once again, it has slats. I imagine it's some kind of bellow of some type, and uh, it could never possibly be machined to that kind of contour. This is a short video showing you the direct metal laser sintering process. Again, much like what you saw in the video, a high-powered laser is being focused on a bed of powder, and then the bed either goes up or goes down uh, to build the, the guts of the part, if you will. The next process I'm going to be speaking about is the electron beam additive manufacturing process, also known as EBAM. Uh, there are different acronyms out there in the world, but we know this process as EBAM, and we've done a lot of work with this process. With this, with this process, within an inert chamber, again, a multi-kilowatt electron beam is used to selectively fuse wire onto a backer plate of similar material. This picture you see here, that, that plate is TIE 6AL4V, titanium 6AL4V, and the material is also matching that with wire 6AL4V wire. Multiple layers of wire deposited forming the rough shape. The process has a very high rate of deposit, which is very, um, very advantageous for higher production parts, but it does form a less detailed part. Again, the most common material that we've touched in this process is titanium 6AL4V. Um, and we have seen often the backer plate that this is the pot, the deposits put on, often warps. And here's a picture where you can see we applied a lot of weight to the product and onto a flat plat in the graphite to creep form that titanium back flat so the customer can use it. Uh, since then, the customer has uh, learned how to uh, counteract the warping by printing on both sides of the plate. And here's an example of the EBAM process and the application thereof. This is courtesy of Skyaki, which I'm proud to say is our customer. And there you can see the, um, the electron beam laying down layers of weld rod or wire to form a shape. Final process I'll be speaking about today is the binder jet process also known as a BJP process. This is very similar, to, this process operates very similar to your copier in your office, laying down ink, and with a heat source, solidifies that ink, whether it be an inkjet or a, a laser, uh, but this is pretty much very similar to that process. A liquid binder is sprayed onto a bed of powder at ambient temperature. The conglomeration of binder and powder is solidified at a low heat source, similar to a heat lamp, and after each layer solidifies, the platform lowers until the 3D part is complete. Notice here, this part, very critical to the BJP process, is temperature uniformity. Um, the, the customer can tell if the part never gets the temperature or if it's above temperature by the, by the dimensional control of the part. As you can see, here's a part that's being run at 2436F plus or minus two degrees. If that's plus or minus three or four degrees, they can tell dimensionally. I could never tell, but they could tell dimensionally that we never got it to temperature or we were we exceeded the temperature. So it's very, very critical. And uh, as you can see, that type STC, we don't have a contact TC because uh, very few contact TCs will hang in there at that kind of temperature. 
So we use the ceramic sheath type SDC to control this to get a real close proximity to the part. The binder jet process is also the lowest cost method of the three that we've discussed so far. And the deposition is very slow. However, the details of the part can be fine. There you see in that picture some, um, some blades that we, um, w that we centered in this process and um, some dog bones. They're both transversals and longitudinal dog bones to understand the metallurgy more of this process. The most common types of materials that we have heat treated here at Solar have been titanium and nickel alloys. And here's the binder jet process from our customer X1, who um, is pretty well known in the BJP process. First, the digital part is created. This is a very small machine, but you can imagine machines as large as a room uh, doing the same process. You must remember when you're operating vacuum furnaces, this process does operate with binder in it too. So that's something that you must be aware of. Hopefully it's all debound out. And I think in this machine, you'll see the platform actually lowers as the part is being built. So, with that little bit of knowledge of the kind of processes that we've heat treated here at Solar, the question, uh, the, the next point I want to bring up is, why is the vacuum furnace really made for additive manufactured parts? That is because all surfaces in additive manufacturing are near net shaped. Therefore, zero tolerance from our customers, they have zero tolerance for contaminated surfaces. Um, in AAM parts so far that we have heat treated, not all, surface are, are, not all surfaces are finished. There is still grinding and finished detail of machining in many parts that need to be done. So not going to totally eliminate machining, uh, but we, today's printing machines, um, they still have to produce some finished machine details. Also, the vacuum furnace is needed because there's critical temperature control, plus or minus two degrees in certain processes are a must. Centering temperatures can approach 2,500 degrees F, and that's prime real estate for vacuum furnaces. In radiant type of heating, a vacuum furnace loves to run at those kind of temperatures. The ability to directly, directly thermocouple thermocouples within the workpiece is very important also. Um, we have pictures I can't share with you, but we have AM parts that are directly thermocoupled per a certain map, so they can understand the differences in mechanical properties within a build. In some processes also, hydrogen partial pressure is needed, which also helps improve mechanical properties. The vacuum furnace can also employ slow ramp rates with lower intermediate holds to help evaporate any kind of residual binders after a D-loop post printing. Again, uh, we don't want binder in there with our vacuum furnace, so as much as that can be baked out prior to uh, the sintering operation, that would be very advantageous for all of our equipment. Graphite fixturing and crucibles are imperative as fixturing for printed parts. As you know, we can never use graphite in 
any kind of atmosphere or air furnace, it'll disintegrate. Graphite remains very strong and very, it stays very straight in any kind of fixturing that we do for PM parts, so, or, or additive manufactured parts. Also most critical, the vacuum levels of 10 to the minus five and 10 to the minus six tour ranges are not only required, they're a must. Uh, we, we also have to bake out all of our fixturing at those very high temperatures and make sure we have a very, very clean furnace. So is additive manufacturing gonna change our heat treating industry? Well, we already saw how it has changed the airspace heat treating dramatically. It's also gonna change the medical device heat treating. Although I have not really heat treated many medical device parts yet printed, uh, but we know that it gives the medical device engineer geometric design freedom of natural anatomical shapes that they never had before. Also, the porous surfaces for bone grafting that we've all seen on these hip or knee implants can also now be printed, which may in fact eliminate or reduce thermal spray applications. We're all not only mentioning, not to mention the bioprinting of human organs and tissues where this technology is further along than we think. So this is facts of what we're out of the manufacturing is going. This is not per Bob Hill, this is uh, actual fact. GE and Lockheed, I would say, are the biggest drivers today of the additive manufactured part world. They, are, they have done their homework. They have looked at every parameter of the design and of the process, and they really understand it. So much so that that fuel engine, that fuel nozzle that you saw in that video, just was certified, I think as of Monday, to fly in the first LEAP engine. Airbus plans to 3D print 30 tons of metal parts monthly by the year 2018. I know for a fact Boeing um, and Airbus want to reduce their buy-to-fly ratios dramatically. Buy-to-fly ratio, buy ratio means currently it takes them about 30 pounds of titanium to make one pound of titanium part that goes in an aircraft. They want that down. They want that to be reduced to two to one two pounds of titanium to make one pound. So the buy-to-fly ratios are huge with Airbus and Boeing. Out of the manufacturing parts are already flying on commercial aircraft. That's a fact. Also another fact, SAE has formed an additive manufacturing committee. They held their first meeting in July of 2015. And the goal of this committee is to generate aerospace industry specifications. In 2014, the additive manufacturing business was a $4.1 billion business. That's billion. Currently, there are 49 system manufacturers in 13 countries producing 12,850 industrial machine, machines around the world. So finally, I'd like to put out some of my predictions. I believe brazing services may be changing. The prime example, again, is that GE fuel nozzle, previously made of 18 components, now all brazed, now it's printed in one part. Printed part is five times more durable, it's 25% higher, lighter. Its printed part has better fuel flow geometry. And with 19 printed, high efficient, lighter fuel nozzles in every LEAP engine, the fuel savings over the life of an airplane will equal $1.5 billion. So again, that's nothing to, to shake your head about. That's, that's, they're real numbers. I also think hot isostatic pressing may become more prevalent for parts made of powder. So the hipping customers or vendors that are on this call, I think the future is bright for hipping. I believe heat treating pricing structures may vary. Um, no more per pound charges, probably more per each charges. Heat treating of less raw materials and processing 
more near finish, near net finished parts may be in our future. Vacuum furnaces, I believe, will be used more than atmospheric furnaces. Thermal spray applications may be altered. Multiple alloys or substrates may comprise a component. So no more we, we will get a, a component in made of one base metal. It may be printed out of several base metals. Heat treating cycles will definitely vary with time as printed parts become more viable. And machining of details will not be eliminated. Once again, I'd just like to emphasize this part of it is the real critical holy grail of the whole additive manufacturing process. We know today transversal and longitudinal strengths vary greatly with the deltas in the feed speeds and heat of the process produced. The metallurgy is much different than melting homogeneously. This is a melt per layer, and there exist inclusions, voids, and other imperfections that need to be validated. And this is the number one problem with additive manufacturing today. This was an interesting slide. I was at the I Titanium Association meeting uh, two months ago, and Dr. Ryan Dehoff of Oak Ridge National Lab presented this. It's only a small piece of ink and elk, maybe one inch by two inches. But he was able to solidify an Inconel 718 sample to various microstructures to predict equiax and columnar strains. So basically, using the energy of additive manufacturing, he was able to flip grains and predictably etch the acronym DOE within the microstructure. To me, if you can do that with energy, we cannot possibly do that with melt technology. So that's, that's a quite, quite a huge advance for the printing world. So this is our today's heat treating customer. This is what it looks like. We walk in our heat treating customer today. We smell the cutting fluids. We see the chips flying. Will this be the heat treating customer tomorrow? I believe the real truth lies somewhere in the middle. For all of the AM worshipers and detractors, 3D printing is neither the answer to all life's problems, nor a flash in the pan. I believe the great American author, uh, author William Arthur Ward says it best when we speak of AM. The additive manufacturing process has really been around for decades, and like any other technology, it has been improving and growing with time. Right now, AM is not forcing manufacturing and heat treaters to abandon decades of conventional manufacturing processes. But we are all starting to trim our sails a bit, especially when the item to heat treat is of a high value and exhibits superior performance. At that, at the end of my uh, talk, I would now like to pass the ball back to Frances, where she will moderate any questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for that excellent presentation. Before we conclude, we do have a few questions from our participants, so we'll get right into those. The first question is, do you get any embrittlement by using hydro hydrogen pressure? That's a very good question, Francis. Um, you would never use hydrogen partial pressure if you were sintering or homogenizing a titanium part. This was used more for stainless steels or ink and L's. Um, but you're correct, any kind of reactive metal, you would never use hydrogen partial pressure. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next question, how important are vacuum levels for properly processing AM components? Very, very important. Very good question. Um, you, you cannot process, if you have a vacuum furnace that does not have a diffusion pump, it only has a, it's only a rough pumping furnace, you can never process, well, I couldn't say, I shouldn't say that. Um, certain processes of the three processes I discussed, um, you, would, you might get away with it with the ABAM process, but um, 
with any of the other finer detailed processes, you could never heat treat a part at, at a minus three tour or minus four tour. You have to be in the six and seven decades of vacuum level. Uh, so you have very, very, yeah, first of all, a completely baked out part, uh, completely baked out fixtures and furnace. Uh, vacuum levels are most important. In fact, many of the specifications do dictate extreme, very extremely deep vacuum levels. Okay, good to know. Um, speaking of EBAM, we have a, a question related to that. Do you see wire replacing powder for EBAM systems? Yes, I, I did not mention that. There are EBAM EBAM systems that do use powder. The beauty with wire, as I said earlier, it lays down much more rapidly. Uh, you can build a part much quicker um, with, with the EBAM process, but yet it gives a, 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 a rougher part. It, it's, a, not a, it's, it's not a near net shape part, so there's more machining, so there's a little bit more waste, but that, that is made up with the quickness of the prototype that can be printed with wire. I also believe there might be, and I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I believe now with the EBAM process, you're really making a weldment, a layers of weldment. So maybe that's a little bit easier to quantify. I don't know uh, how they're making out with that, but I'm not privy to that information. But uh, it, would, it would definitely have less inclusions, I would think, and less porosity than powder. Okay, very good. Um, another question, how was the 25% savings in weight achieved in the fuel injector? So over the current design, the, the, the fuel nozzle looks totally different than what I braised in the past. Um, they have much smoother, I don't know the the, the, the design aspects of the fuel nozzle, but from what I know, the fuel flow geometries within the part are much more efficient. Therefore, it delivers the fuel to the engine uh, much more efficiently and at a lower rate. Um, not only the weight savings, but I think the fuel flow design geometry of the printed part is really where the savings is. Um, you know, we will find more out about this as the, as the LEAP engine uh, gets on more aircraft. But as I mentioned, it just was certified to fly as of Monday, the first LEAP engine. Um, and from what I understand, it's all about the fuel flow geometries of that nozzle, which saves 15% of, of fuel savings, which as you know, an aircraft, commercial aircraft, that could be the difference of being, making a, an airliner profitable or not. Very interesting. Um, another question here, why is a vacuum furnace necessary over an argon atmosphere furnace? That's a good question. Um, I guess if, if an argon furnace is tight, a bell furnace, I guess they're referring to. If, if an argon furnace is tight, they're typically used with sand seals or O-rings. I don't know how they do it, but I'm not, I am familiar with some argon furnaces, but as long as it's totally inert, um, you could do it. However, I will say some of these process, processes require very, very fast cooling rates. You would never be able to achieve that in an argon bell. So as long as it's totally inert and the cycle, I can say of all the parts that we've processed here, uh, we probably have, right now we've accumulated over 100 different cycles per each process, per each cycle. And some require fast cooling rates, some require fast heating rates, some require slow cooling rates. So it depends upon the product and if you're working in a retort type of argon furnace, I think that would preclude you from doing some of these things. Okay, very good. Okay, also another the question. Fact, also the fact, Francis, 
I might just mention uh, being able to internally thermocouple the part is most critical. As long as you can do that in an argon furnace, you'll be okay. But uh, within the vacuum furnace, it's very easy to internally thermocouple the part um, at, at various places. Okay, thank you, Bob. Another question. Some of the wear parts require heat treatment after 3D printing and may create distortion on thinner wall thicknesses of the final 3D printed part. What is your suggestion to deal with this issue? I, I would really need to know the example of the thinner wall process. If it's a thinner wall printed part, um, we would have to see how thin and how that thing could possibly be fixtured. Really would not know, but if, if the person asking that question, if they want to talk to me offline about that actual applica application, I would be glad to. Okay, very good. Um, another question, do you see an advantage in hipping EBAM with wire like we do in powder? So, the wire EBAM that we have heat treated, I believe, has also been hipped. Um, we do not hip here at solar atmospheres, um, but I believe um, some of the wire printed parts that we have that we have centered here, we have homogenized, um, have been hipped in the past. I don't get involved with that. We simply send it on to the next vendor. But I know a few of the parts have been hit. Okay, good. Um, you mentioned eliminating plate distortion with building on both sides of the plate. Is this done simultaneously on both sides or on yes. one side and then refixturing? No, they, they actually print, they, now they have the EBAM producer uh, 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 that has done this, that we've gotten, that we received plates now printed uh, uh, printed parts on both sides of the plate, it's a mirror image, and they actually do it simultaneously to avoid that distortion. If you would print one side, it would warp the one way, and then you would have problems refixturing it the other way. So they do it simultaneously. Oh, that's interesting. Um, another question, will there be more heat treatment needed post-manufacturing using AM to improve ductility? That's a very good question. Yes, I agree. I agree with that statement. Uh, we have seen a lot of annealing, a lot of stress relieving after printing. So that's why, what I meant by our heat treating cycles may change entirely. But yes, um, there are stresses built up by this process for sure. And uh, many people, they're trying to understand that. And we have seen a lot of annealing and stress relieving cycles with printed parts. Okay, good. Here's a general question. When do you expect aerospace industry specifications and new verification standards to be accomplished? Ooh, that's a very good question. I, I will tell you, GE and Lockheed have them already in place. I believe they do, but they're in-house processes and they, they invested a lot of money and so, so it should remain there. Um, until the rest of the industry catches up with that, I could, not, I could not look into my crystal ball and tell you, but I think we're years away uh, from that kind of validation. It seems like it, it's, it's all being taken on, taken on by the primes, so until SAE, uh, comes up or the these, these specification AMEC uh, comes up with a, um, uh, with a plan, I think, quite honestly, many, many of the people in these committees think out of the manufacturing, hocus pocus, it'll go away. I can understand their, their understanding of that because it's totally different metallurgy than what we're used to. But um, there are people on, on, on the forefront of this manufacturing process. And I think uh, the, those committees have to learn from the primes, if they can. Okay, good. 
Okay, another question. Why does a vacuum furnace better lend itself to internal thermocoupling? Well, it's very simple to, with the, with the jack panels that we have today, it's very simple to thermocouple and the, and the type of feed throughs that we have today, it's very simple to thermocouple uh, up to 50 different points, how many different thermocouples you want within a vacuum furnace. It's more difficult to do it to thermocouple internally within a batch or a continuous furnace uh, because of the moving parts. Um, and and it, you, need a, you need a direct sensor and you need it actually in the part on, at various points of the furnace. And the vacuum furnace, the batch vacuum furnace, just lends itself very nicely to that. Okay, very good. I think we have time for just one more question. So we'll make this the final one. Have you found that you have already had to change some traditional heat treat parameters to try to optimize mechanical properties? Of printed parts, I assume. Yes. Uh, oh, most definitely. Um, parts that that I would normally run at, at with partial pressure, say nitrogen or partial pressure, we didn't worry about vacuum level. We have to worry about vacuum level with printed parts. It's a near net shape. They're not machining a lot of material off. We have to worry about alpha case when we're working with titanium. Uh, we have to have ultra pure furnaces, clean furnaces, whenever you're dealing with a near net shape, and 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 it, it definitely does change our our mode of thinking here. When uh, you know when when you're running tool steel all day long, or you're running other titanium wrought products, plate, sheet, billet, and you, you you know you might be okay to you know a micron or one times ten to the minus three tour and wait till the vacuum recovers, but without the manufactured parts, you have to have good vacuum levels all the way throughout the cycle. That's what we have found. Good to know. That's re very interesting. Um, thank you, Bob. And unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all of the questions we received, but in a few days, all participants will receive an email with further contact information. I now encourage you to complete the brief survey that will appear on the screen. With your input, we can continue to provide webinars with high-quality, practical information that you can use. I also encourage you to follow up with Bob for more information about how additive manufacturing may change the heat treating world. Once again, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsor of today's webinar, Solar Atmospheres. The solar family of companies located in eastern and western Pennsylvania South Carolina, and Southern California all process small and large parts of varying material compositions. With their heavy R&D orientation, these world-class vacuum heat treatment and brazing shops specialize in resolving difficult thermal processing situations. For more information, visit the website address on your screen. Thank you again for participating in this ASM webinar. Have a great day, everybody.